All right, welcome back, uh, Professor Joyce. This is Economics 1001. We're going to look at Chapter 3 today, which is going to speak about comparative advantage. Again, if you're just tuning into these recitations, these are the recitations that accompany the lectures that we're doing once a week uh, in Echo 1001 here at Baruch. And as in all these recitations, I will do 10 questions. Each time I will stop after I read the question or something, give you a moment to kind of think of what's going on, and we'll come back and we'll go through the answer together. I'll often go through all four choices if necessary, because I think they may be illuminating um, as to what we're talking about here in class. But as an overview today, we're talking about trade. And one of the miracles of economics is this notion of comparative advantage. That even if a country like the U.S. is more productive in the production of, let's say, cars and wheat than a country like Argentina, for example, it can still be to the U.S.'s advantage to trade with Argentina because even though we have an absolute advantage in the production of these particular goods, we may not have a, we won't have a comparative advantage in both goods. In other words, we're going to benefit from specialization and trade with Argentina even though, again, we are more productive in the creation of both goods than Argentina is. So that's the miracle of comparative advantage. That's what I'm going to talk about today. And I'll start right off with the first problem in your recitation. And we're going to go through a number of parts of it. All right, so it goes like this. It says, uh, refer to figures 3, 4, which is right on your table, your, your test there. It says, the opportunity cost of one loaf of bread for Barney is. So I've drawn the curves here. We have Barney's production possibility frontier. Let's assume both Barney and I think it's Betty here. So all right, Betty up here. Right? These are two individuals, it could be two countries, whatever. The example is just, again, is going to press this notion of comparative advantage. So Barney can make two things. He can make bread or pies. He's a baker. If he puts a day's worth of labor, let's say, he can make seven loaves of bread or an hour's worth of labor, or he can make 14 pies. And this is the production possibility frontier, which we discussed in Chapter 2. This says he can have any combination he wants of pies and bread along this line here. He cannot produce out here. This exceeds his productive capability in terms of labor time and, and resources, okay? So this is Barney's production possibility frontier. Again, he can produce seven piece, loaves of bread if he devotes all his time to bread, or if he produces no bread, he can, he can produce 14 pies. Let's look at Betty. Betty is a heck of a baker, right? She, with the same amount of time that Barney's devoting, let's say it's uh, an hour's worth, she can make 20 loaves of bread if she devotes all her time to making bread, and she can make 15 pies if she makes no bread and devotes all her time to pies. So this, again, represents Betty's production possibility frontier. This shows you the combinations of bread and pies that Betty can produce if she distributes herself between the two tasks. But again, if she specializes, she can get 20 bread, or she can have 15 pies if she produces only pies. All right, that's the background of this problem. So now they say, what's the opportunity cost of one loaf of bread for Barney? So, opportunity cost, right? We want to know every time Barney produces a loaf of bread, what does it cost him in terms of pies? In other words, if he is, for example, right here producing all pies, and he decides to move over and produce less pies and go up here and produce some bread, okay, how many pies does he give up? That's the opportunity cost of moving from here to here, from point A to point B. You have to give up some pies in the production in order to produce some bread. All right? So now they're asking here, what's the opportunity cost of a loaf of bread for Barney? So every time Barney produces a loaf of bread, we'll say he can have seven bread or he can have 14 pies. OK? Therefore, one bread, if I divide both sides by seven, is equal to two pies. For Barney, that's the opportunity cost. Every time he produces another bread, he's got to give up two pies. So if he went from 14 to zero pies, he'd give up 14 pies to produce seven breads. Therefore, he gives up two pies for every bread he produces. That's the opportunity cost uh, for Barney. That's the opportunity cost of making bread. So, with that, I just gave you the answer, obviously. If you look on it, the answer is D to number one. The answer is two pies. All right? Again, make sure you understand that. The opportunity cost is every time you want to produce that particular good, 
how much do you have to give up of the other good? All right, next question. It says, the opportunity cost of one pie for Betty. So let's go to Betty. Every time she produces a pie now, what does she have to give up in terms of bread? Well, again, as we've talked about in class, the best way to write these problems out is to use the entire curve. So you can say, we know that Betty can produce 20 bread is equal to 15 pies. So now they're asking you, what is the opportunity cost of one pie for Betty? So if she, if she produces a pie, how many breads does she have to give up? Well, let's divide both sides by 15, divide this by 15, divide this by 15, and you come out with that one for Betty, one pie is equal to 20 divided by 15, or four thirds of a bread, okay? So one pie, every time she produces a pie, every time she goes this way, she has to give up some bread. How much? Well, every time she produces one pie, she's going to give up four-thirds of a loaf of bread. That's her opportunity cost of producing a pie. All right, so as we look down the list here, you can see there it is. It's answer D. It's four-thirds of a loaf of bread, and there's how we got it. All right, so... We can move through these pretty quickly, but now they, they start to pick up a little bit and kind of uh, focus. So look at number three. Number three says, Barney has an absolute advantage in which good? All right, let's pause for a second. Absolute advantage, what does that mean? Absolute advantage is this notion that you can produce more than someone else using the same amount of resources. In other words, the resource here is labor. So let's say it's like an hour of Barney's labor. Does an hour of Barney's labor, he isn't, can he produce more bread than Betty? Absolutely not. Can Barney produce more pies than Betty? Nope. She can produce 15 in an hour of labor. He can produce only 14 in one hour of labor. So Barney's really less productive than Betty in the production of both goods. In short, Barney has no absolute advantage. All right? None whatsoever. And so when you go looking for the answer here, as we'll do it together here, Barney has an absolute advantage in... The answer is D, neither good, and Betty is an absolute advantage in both goods. Pause for a second, all right? Again, in one hour of labor, Betty can produce 15 pies to Barney's 14. She has an absolute advantage in the production of pies. In that same hour of labor, if Betty devoted all her time to making bread, she could get 20 loaves of bread. Whereas Barney, if he devoted all his time to producing bread, could get only seven loaves of bread. So... Betty has an absolute advantage in both bread and pies. So why would she ever bother to trade? Or should she trade with Barney? This is where we're going with this notion of comparative advantage. The answer is she should trade with Barney. She's actually going to make herself better off, even though she has an absolute advantage in the production of both goods.